Hi Ed, February the 14th, 2021. I responded to your post on the All Things of the Past site with a question about the nature of the death of Adam and you asked me to address the question to you, all of which I've done. However, after the communication with a few regarding the post, I came across some serious errors. The very error I have brought up, and I'm asking if you had dealt with them in your dealings with Don Preston. So here is my amended question and review of my discussions, and may I say, not a very pleasant exchange with some. The question is about the sad and awful universal effect upon the human race that Adam's sin and disobedience, which led to his death, is a comprehensive or manifold death. I'm asking you to deal with and understand how Adam, we, his children, have had to live with it to this day. How it affects both Jew and Gentile. We find ourselves dead in trespasses and sins. When we are awakened, we know our sinfulness and of a righteous condemnation for our sins. We welcome the good news of justification by the death and resurrection of Christ and the imputation of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Explain the nature of this death in terms of the body, the soul, and society. How death affected his uprightness, his mind, his affections, desires, aspirations, passions, and his will, all of which affect us today. At the Reformation, they treated this subject under the subject of original sin. Luther and company spoke of the bondage of the will. We today are swamped in the religious world with statements like Men are free. We have free will. The majority of evangelicals seem to overthrow the doctrine of the fall of man in Adam. They say we can choose to follow God or not at any time. That man does not need the grace of regeneration, all of which the fall of Adam and us in him affects us today. We are sunk in this death. Show how the incarnate Son of God dealt with this comprehensive death for the elect that is, all who have and will believe. Show how the work of Christ dealt with the physical death of the soul and body and of the death of which the whole world lives in today. Do these questions help? Further to my questions, I've just had a few exchanges on the all things of the past and have uncovered two serious errors held and taught and I've been ungraciously opposed. I've stated that the Lord Jesus always was the Son of God from all eternity, that he did not become the Son of God at his incarnation, that this matter has already been treated by Christian men in the past and sought it. I've also stated that Jesus became the sacrificial, living sacrifice for the sins of his people at his death, that the sins of his people were laid upon him in his dying hour. He was in fact made to sin by imputation, the sin of his people, and he died for them all. In fact, I stated that Jesus during his incarnation was not omnipresent. He was not in Jerusalem or elsewhere as a man at the same time in his body, that he grew in knowledge and stature as a man. However, when he died, the eternal Son of God experienced death, the death due to Adam as a man. So in one sense, the blood of Christ was the blood of God, a living God, dying as a living sacrifice for the sins of his people. All necessary to overcome the death that Adam was threatened with and experienced and for us to be delivered from, it being a comprehensive or manifold death. I was mocked, told I was arrogant and a Baptist. So I rebuked two respondents and had to ask serious questions several times. I asked, was I speaking to a man or a woman, but got no answer. The Father did not die, but the Son did die. Jesus did not become the Son of God at the Incarnation. He always was the Son of God from all eternity. The Father always was the Eternal Father. He never became the Father at the Incarnation of his Son. He always was the Eternal Father. Jesus was not his own Father. The Father and Son are eternal persons, each possessing the whole of the divine nature. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. The doctrine of the eternal sonship is at stake. 
John 1, 18, Mark 15, 37, And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. He that has seen the Son has seen the Father. The Father and the Son are the one God. Two distinct divine persons, the Father eternally begat the Son, the Son was always in the bosom of the Father before all things. However, the Father did not die. The Holy Ghost did not die. But the Son of God gave up his breath and died. He died as a substitute, as a vicarious sacrifice, and he died for sin, the sins of his people. He made him who knew no sin, made so by imputation, in just the same way as all men are made sinners when Adam sinned. All men are made sinners by Adam's transgression, made so by imputation. Corinthians 5, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 1 Corinthians 1, 15. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. All men in Adam died, and so doomed to die. The Lord Jesus was the only one who would never have died, for he knew no sin. He was impeccable, able to die but being put to death by a sinful man, but would never have died a natural death. He was the spotless son or lamb of God. 1 John 29, 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming to him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The doctrine of the fall of man in Adam, and the nature and kind of death that was threatened to Adam and took place on the day Adam sinned, are essential. It is important in order to preserve the doctrine of redemption from sin and death by the Lord Jesus Christ, to show he always was the eternal only begotten Son from eternity. These two points relating to the eternal sonship of Jesus Christ and his dying the very hour he died at the ninth hour is essential to the gospel. My communication with those on the all things of the past sight ruffled a few feathers. He died once, rose again, never to die again. And I had to rebuke some for being impudent, impatient for being in error. They did not like it and I was called arrogant and one felt he had to run to you to step in. I stated that the error of a denial of the eternal sonship and of his being made sin for his people were worse than the errors they were opposing in Don Preston. It would be a very good thing for you to address these very issues. I also include two posts dealing with these doctrinal errors only to be told they're Baptist errors. I stated that I was a Christian and that I had spoken Christian doctrine and that whilst I baptised, I stated that there was no efficacy in water baptism. As you can drag a man from the UK to the USA under water, it won't make a scrap of difference. It won't make a natural man into a spiritual man. My reference posts are enclosed. I don't need to reinvent the wheel and say it all in my words. They are Dr John Gill's Body of Doctrine on Practical Divinity, books 1, 2, 3 and 4 and a dissertation on the eternal sonship of Christ. Please find it closed, access via the links below. I now include Dr John Gill's dissertation on the doctrine of the Trinity, all free of charge. Regards in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, David Clark.